Good evening. Welcome. I'm Ann McLean from the Library's Music Division. This is a great crowd. We're so pleased so many of you could come. This is a fantastic quartet. We're very excited to be presenting the remarkable Jerusalem Quartet tonight, truly one of the great exceptional quartets. We are looking forward to your concert and welcome. We too. Yeah, we are looking so we also. We have Alexander Pavlovsky and Sergei Bressler here who are speaking on behalf of the whole quartet, two violinists. You guys are really a presence on major stages worldwide, and I know you were in Australia and New Zealand. You have two annual tours to the U.S., I understand. That's unusual, but there's a lot of demand. And, of course, you have commitments for all the top festivals. This year, you are reaching 24 years together. Is that right? Or maybe more? Yeah. Well, you know, after 20 years, we stopped counting exactly, <laughs> but... No, there are some great conductors that celebrate their 70s or 60s birthday for nine years, and then they start the new celebrations. Yeah, we are, we are trying not to make, you know, kind of extreme projects, but uh, we appreciate our time together. We enjoy. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so next, next yeah, the, our first concert was in March 95. So our first major concert recorded, yeah. So, yeah, next March will be our 25th anniversary, yeah. And only I still have this tape, cassette from this concert, <coughs> 25 years ago, yeah. And I cannot listen to it because I don't have the tape, tape already, but... But I did a few couple of years ago, and it's actually good. <laughs> I'm not sure we can play in such a beautiful way today after so many years. We play differently, of course, but it was, you know... Because that day, we, that days we studied like one year of three pieces, and now we play really a lot. So. <laughs> and uh, only one player changed in that whole time, right? So yeah, that's, that's kind correct. of unusual these days. There's yes. Musical chairs for many quartets, literally. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I want, and you were the oldest when you came together. You guys really grew up together as teens. Yeah, we understand. started in uh, actually before in '94, and we were in in uh, in the school, music school, uh, Jerusalem Music Academy pre pre, pre division. And uh, there's also a Jerusalem Music Center who puts uh, talented uh, kids together to play chamber music, and uh, it was um, under. Uh, Isaac Stern, uh, he was a patron of this uh, music center. Uh, and he, and uh, the, cham the chamber music the department put us together. Uh, and since then, <laughs> we are together till now. I was reading about um, your work with, uh, was it Avi Abramovich? And how much you worked for like four or five years together. And I wanted Six. to ask you, you know, one of the things that you read about this quartet is that they have a remarkable homogeneity of sound and an uh, attack, a unity of attack and purpose and things like this. But from the very beginning, that's been a qualifying factor. Do you think it's because you started out so very young together? And if not, how did you begin to work on this? Well, yes. Yes, I think uh, starting in such a young age, when you still develop your own playing, it's a crucial moment, and I think this is a plus we have from many other groups. It's not only because, you know, kind of we are friends and grew up together, but we really had a first very basic work together with Avi Abramovich on many major quartet works, and as Sergei already mentioned, you know, those days we had time and we were practicing four times a week, for probably three, four hours on maybe two, three pieces in a year, which means every note was, you know, observed from different perspectives and bows, and he really, really put all his passion and love into chamber music in our group. We were one of his very first successful groups in Israel as well. And, of course, we were little hooligans then. We were like... Yeah, I was the oldest, and I think I was 16. So basically between 14 and 16 years old, teenagers. <laughs> yeah, but somehow it worked, and we enjoyed uh, basically our music making and the music uh, itself for the quartet. String quartet has probably the widest and the most 
interesting repertoire from most of the composers. Every composer put his really the top ideas and the qualities into quartet writing. So it's a privilege to play string quartets, you know. <laughs> Did you have any idea then that you might make a career as a quartet at all? Were you thinking like that? That days probably not, but after one or two years it was kind of wow. We are going to, to I, make I, it. <laughs> yeah, we're going yes, really, because I thought it's something new for me and it's such a great music, different from solo playing. And actually we we actually we played a lot of concert after two years already. We won a, a competition, Graz competition, Schubert competition in Graz. And uh, we prepared a lot of program, so it was really serious after just the beginning. And I also want to add that actually we really have to say thank you for all our private teachers of instrumental instrumental teachers that allowed us in a way to take a lot of time out of our general practice and somehow to understand that this is going to be special and this is important because there are many, many, many examples when wonderful young musicians meet together and their teachers just say you cannot uh, dedicate such a amount of time, you know, doing ensembles. You have to practice, 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 practice. Uh, Paganini, Paganini. <laughs> And somehow all of our uh, teachers understood, of course, with the time, that we really need this time, which also develops us. Uh, it's you know, probably the best school to, to listen to each other is playing chamber music. So that was their also clever understanding and decision. That's what you said in one of the uh, things I was reading that chamber music opens the mind. And that, I love that quote. But you were saying it taught you at a very young point in your life to listen very closely, and this was a foundation for you. This is probably the main quality that chamber music, every musician needs. And by the way, today there are a very big number of wonderful soloists as well. That I'm talking about really the top soloists, and you really very quickly can hear by their playing if they also dedicate time to chamber music or not. It's very clear from the after a minute of their playing. I also, so many young musicians playing really seriously and professionally string quartets. In our time, it wasn't like this. In the 90s, it's, it's, it was a little bit more than in 60s and 70s, but still, it wasn't like a main, main profession for many, many musicians. But now it's, people understand, young, young players understand that this is, the, this is the music, this is the, probably the most important music. Really incredible the growth in the string quartet industry, so to speak. I mean, there are just so many fine, and you probably teach them and mentor them all the time these days. Do you, do you have time for teaching, though? Yeah, I, I teach a lot in Jerusalem. Uh, actually, I became a, a, a in Jerusalem music center when we started. I became the director of the chamber uh, chamber uh, chamber players. Like, uh, keep for I put kids together and I teach them. Uh, speaking about young musicians, uh, I know two of you, I'm not sure, I think it's Ori, but I'm not sure, maybe it's you, Alexander, work with the uh, Western Eastern Divan Orchestra, Ves Osusha It's actually our other two members, our cellist and Ori, the viola this player. Yeah, they Jordan made many years, connect, they were connected with the Divan Orchestra, and Kirill was teaching their cello section for, I think, almost a decade. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. From the very beginning, I think, from this of this project. So um, back to the just the way you go at things and rehearse together and so on. You, some of you have in the quartet have said the most important thing is for the quartet to have its own voice, but to feel that you're together one instrument with sixteen strings. But that's not always one instrument. So many of you. And I was going to ask you, how do you go about working? How do you, how do you attack a new piece? How do you think about it? You've done this so many years, and yet you have some new things, and we're going to get to that in a minute, some really exciting new projects. It's difficult to say because so many conversations in one, uh, in one rehearsal. But somehow we achieve some, uh, because we have this, uh, probably our main ideas are the same. The sound ideas, the intonation ideas, the style ideas, mostly the same. So we, somehow we achieve the, the best of us. 
you last year you did a wonderful recording with both WC and Ravel, and tonight you're playing the Ravel. Um, and of course, a lot of people pair these two together. They were written a decade apart, and so on. And there are things that unite them, like thematic, cyclic development, and so on. When you were preparing this recording, what were you thinking about and differentiating them and stylistically? And what are the points of color-wise that you like the most? Well, first I must mention that Ravel was one of the pieces we played almost from the very beginning. And the Debussy, actually to the Debussy, we came much later, maybe even 20 years later, which maybe should be the opposite because Debussy actually wrote the first, the quartet. And of course, Ravel has kind of, kind of connection or his uh, vision of Ravel Quartet as well. You can see it by the movement styles and uh, the general balance of the pieces. Uh, they're different, very different quartets. Even they're written very close to each other, I think, the very end of the 19th century and very beginning of 20th So there may be five or six years in between. Uh, for my taste, Debussy had, uh, in a way, kind of much more German direction of roots oh. of this quartet. And it's known that he was very young when he wrote his quartet, and he was trying to make his kind of beginning of his career in Paris. And there were many, many music clubs. And most of the music which was played there was Beethoven, Brahms, Haydn, so very German uh, uh, culture. And uh, that's also the reason he put it, added Opus 10 to his quartet, that it will look like very serious. And uh, that's the only Opus, I think, in all of his pieces. Also, Opus 10 in G. So it looks very kind of like, like you open the Beethoven quartet. And um, indeed, in his uh, ideas, there are many, many uh, roots from Beethoven, I think, especially from Beethoven. This is uh, also how he balanced the movements, how he goes from one idea to another idea. Um, a lot of very German uh, middle voices, so the um, kind of, if you take out the melody, it sounds like sometimes even the Haydn quartet. And Ravel already, for my taste, it's much, it has more variety in the tonal, uh, qualities and it's for my taste it's also uh, has much more variety in his writing and of course about the tonal vision you know if uh, it should be it should be really the platelet of uh, the palette palette of colors very wide in both pieces but I think in Ravel there are some moments that it's even hard to describe exactly. It's just a moment that you have to catch and it's gone. Yeah. And then you always read about the Gamelan references and our colleague tonight who's written the notes says there's also a chance that Ravel was thinking about hearing a group of mandolinists on a street mm. in Paris. Have you heard that one? That was new to <laughs> no, me. No, I didn't. It's very interesting. <laughs> And there's, if you look in your program tonight, there's a fun quote, and you guys probably know this too, um, a letter from W.C. to Ravel. Yes. It's so, so funny, but he, he basically says, don't play it less loudly, go for it, you know. Um, yeah. Don't hold back, and he said, think of the difference in sonority between a hall that's full and one that's empty. It's only the viola that slightly obscures the others and could perhaps be toned down. <laughs> Otherwise, don't touch anything, and all will be well. Unbelievable. And his uh, teacher, and the one who dedicated Ravel, dedicated quartet to Gabriel Fauré, and somehow the the Fauré was not very uh, excited about this work, and the public as well, and it was not very successful from the beginning, because we always felt that this is really kind of one of the most amazing quartets written. And somehow, it's strange because, for example, when we talk about Beethoven, even uh, the time of uh, middle quartets, the musicians, even the musicians, they said, it's, first of all, it's extremely difficult. It's 
not good. It's just the music is not good. This is different times. We are talking about 100 years ago, and somehow public did not react in a way that I think it's just proper to react to. This is amazing music from the very first note. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Just yeah. kind of taking all of you and just, you just follow. <laughs> but it's always like that with all <laughs> this. Uh, revolutionary works it has to pass like 40 years and people will love it and in <laughs> the beginning it's just like nonsense people let's say the Beethoven last quartets the, the middle quartets uh, also let's say Shostakovich quartets and especially Bartok Bartok was super more modern for his time and really right. what is this music but now it's kind of like a classic really classic and Master. You guys perform the Beethoven quartets alongside the Bartok quartets. I've never heard of anybody doing that. Uh, that's a tremendous energy required for that and a commitment. Um, and you're, you've done, I mean, not night after night necessarily, but just to partner the two sets is extraordinary. I was going to ask you too, are you planning something special for the Beethoven year? Along we, are, we are doing Beethoven cycle, of course. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yes. <laughs> I think it's probably really special for us, but because we still didn't, we did a lot of cycles like Shostakovich, Brahms, Bartok, many things, but Beethoven is cycle as cycle is new for us, and we're really preparing it. Yeah, working, and looking working forward. Slowly. Today, I, I must, uh, I must say that uh, even from 20, 25 years ago, many things changed. I see today a young quartets, but very good quartets, that they start their career from Beethoven cycle. There are a few examples. And like, oh, wow, I mean, it took us almost 25 years slowly, you know, to build and to understand and to go back to some quartets we played and to look from other perspective and to find a way. So it's, it, it is exciting for us, you know. We feel that we are now mentally really prepared because <laughs> there are many quartets that that we are played already 20 years ago. We play really differently now. All the all the understanding of the music is different. So I'm glad we are doing it now and not 20 years ago. We've, um, I want to ask you about Shostakovich too, and then maybe some of your your new projects. Um, but regarding Shostakovich, I know is three of you have Russian backgrounds, uh, and one I think Ori also is uh, has this background a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you've you've made comments about how you felt this composer tells your story as well. That was a, a narrative statement that really touched me. But um, this is kind of a special special journey for you, all Shostakovich quartets, I believe. This kind of music you have to really feel. If you not really understand and feel it, you cannot really play it because it's not technically it's not extremely difficult. If you not really feel the atmosphere, if you not feel the time and the the, the problematic and the, all this, his thoughts, it's impossible to play. You really don't understand this music. And we we are lucky that we are. We are I was born in Ukraine. Also Sasha was born in Ukraine. In Soviet Union, former Soviet Union. So we, we knew about this time, we knew about this character of the music, so we feel really lucky to, to bring it to the public, what we feel. And you studied with people who knew him and, and really yes. have this yes. tremendous yeah. yes. background. Yeah. Which yes. Our teacher was telling, he was studying exactly in the Moscow Conservatory with uh, David Oystra, our teacher of both of us, uh, Matvey Lieberman. Exactly after the war, the time when uh, Borodin Quartet started to play, and they were really in the same years st uh, studying in Moscow. And uh, he said that many times uh, during the lessons with Oystrach, and Shostakovich was open, uh, was opening the door and looking who is uh, ah, he was you know he was very polite, and it was very difficult to get something from him. Like e even if you play Shostakovich concerto or some, you know, he was like beautiful, great. So. And actually, today we play quartet number three, and this is one of the quartets that, uh, after uh, Beethoven quartet played it for him for the first time, he was really crying, and that they said that it's never happened in their very long uh, friendship that he was so moved by his own music. Oh yeah, 
So tears were coming out of his eyes. <laughs> and you, have, one of you, I, I made a note about the Shostakovich quartets are modern in language, but classical and compact. And that's an interesting thing that I hadn't thought of before. Well, I think we always yeah. talked between ourselves that this is the actually the very last classical composer. Definitely connected to the Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven more than any other direction. Of course, Structural. very romantic as well, but the structure, the, the language, and even when you open the score and look at the quartet, it looks like... The way the thematic material... Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's written right, Some like, <laughs> like, like Haydn quartet, but the music is so, let's say, sarcastic that it's, it's, you can listen differently. But it's written as, as a score, sometimes really, really classical. No, I remember somebody asked him, I'm not sure who was that, listen, Dmitry, there are not so many notes written. Look, uh, other composers like Bartok, it's so complicated, he said, not the number of notes important, what is between the notes important. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about this new project you're doing, which is kind of amazing, and I want you to talk. I'm going to just sit back for a moment. Um, Harmonia Mundi is the label that these guys record, record for, and they have, of course, many just impeccable and stellar recordings. But you have a new venture of Yiddish music, um, Jewish music between the wars, and particularly songs. And it was a commission, right? Uh, that's the part that interests me, that you chose to start this project yourself out of nowhere. Yeah. Somehow uh, we, recording, we are recording for Harmonia Mundi for more than a decade and a half. So I think there are almost 15 or 16 years of recordings with the same label. And we were always you know, in conversation with them, looking for something out of our mainstream. Because in a way we are very conservative quartet. We are playing Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Brahms. DBC Shostakovich. Uh, we are not experimental quartet, definitely not. And uh, we were thinking maybe to dedicate one of our albums to Israeli music. There are actually a very good variety of modern composers and uh, as well quartets written. And somehow it didn't happen. And then uh, this idea came and uh, our viola player Ori Kam actually put a lot of effort that it will happen. He was in touch with the library in uh, Hebrew University in Jerusalem with the uh, lady who is in charge of music department. I don't remember her name. And she said that there's a lot, a lot, a lot, of plenty of fantastic music from the Eastern Europe between two wars. So actually first half of 20th century, mostly songs and with different uh, characters, and she has a lot of materials in the library. That's how it started, and of course with the support of Harmonia Mundi. Um, after many discussions, uh, the decision was to have an arrangement for quartet and soprano of a number of songs. And uh, we asked Leonid Disatnikov, which is a wonderful composer and uh, who worked for many, many years with Gidon Kremer and Kremerata Baltica and many other uh, great musicians. And he was head of uh, Bolshoi, the opera, the great opera of Russia for a couple of years. And uh, he's an amazing arrangement. He makes uh, wonderful arrangements of different uh, uh, different um, uh, music for different ensembles. Uh, and uh, we asked him, and he was uh, very interested in do it, doing arrangement for us and for soprano. And uh, the result are five songs uh, in Yiddish, of course, uh, that he arranged wonderfully for us. And we are lucky that we, this project we are doing with also fantastic Israeli soprano Hila Bajo, that she's the, one of the main singers in Israeli opera. Um, and uh, we are actually in the beginning of this project. We already made the CD. It should be out in a couple of months. And uh, there is a lot of interest of this uh, 
project and uh, uh, we added to the songs music of uh, Schulhoff and Korngold. The Korngold interested me too. Talk a little bit about that. The second quartet, right? Yes. yes. His music not played much, yeah. uh, but today, today it feels like uh, it, it's waking up and uh, <laughs> a lot of attention goes to Korngold as well as it used to be like a decade ago to music of Weinberg. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, three of his quartets are very good. I love all of them, very different, of course, uh, with the very solid roots of Europe. Viennese. Uh, Viennese roots and of course his yeah. uh, life in America in the second part of his life made a lot of uh, uh, and in in the result, it's wonderful music. Wonderful. It was, music. It was great to 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 great experience to study it because you you can see the Viennese and the Czech a little bit and the Hollywood music. It was so so. It's an interesting yeah. mixture. It was yes. really really interesting. Exactly, and the the notes that are coming out about your recording mention that um, this music from between the wars had a very strong influence on. Um, not only Hollywood, the music industry and the film industry, which of course Korn Korngold was strongly involved in, but on popular music in the U.S. in general. Mm -hmm. And that's a fascinating thread to trace through. So I, I'm really looking forward to hearing this recording. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. So um, for us, it's of course something different. And we are, I think, enjoying every moment of this. And uh, as I said, there is a big interest in, in Europe. We'll, I think there are in the next couple of seasons, around 20 concerts with this project, which is a good number. Really? That's and it grows, yeah, yeah. Big attention to this. Fascinating. <laughs> well, you know, we, we often go on and on in these things, and I wanted to, this time to open it up to your questions because I want to give the artists a little time to warm up on this stage more than they had a chance to. But So um, if there's microphones that will be coming around, by all means, please um, ask some questions. Anybody have something? Okay, a couple on here. Uh, two questions. First of all, do uh, any of you play as soloists too, or only in, um, in the group, in your quartet? And the second question, as an amateur, I, I hardly play anything, I'm just curious how you say your music has changed, playing the same piece has changed over the years. Could you give us some idea of how, how it's changed and how you've reinterpreted music? Well, um, you see, if you're talking, for example, about Beethoven Quartet, when you play one of his pieces, and then you learn the second one, and the third one, and with the time you play 16 pieces of the same composer, and you understand actually his development, his connections to the past and to the future, and it just, you know, like it's a book. When you start to read the book and you go on and on, you understand more the language of the writer. It's, I think it's about the same story. You just see different examples and you, ah, if I remember that happened, you know, playing last quartet. Ah, this is interesting. This idea came actually 40 years ago to him. Yeah, so these kind of elements, so with the time, it's like you add, 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 and your knowledge and view on certain things are different. Of course, and also, uh, of course, the experience that you get playing on the stage and, you know, experience looking at the score is different when you are 16 years old or when you are 26, 36, 46. Yeah. In music, there is no, I think there's no point that you, ah, okay, now I, I'm professor. Yes, I know. In it's another 20 endless, It's endless progress. It's in another 20 years, we will play differently, I'm sure. Probably better, probably less good, but never know. In the first question, of course, we are playing a little bit solo, but mostly our, we play chamber music, quartet and this thing. I was just wondering, during the years when you were forming 
your quartet, were there certain uh, working string quartets or recordings or specific performances that really inspired you to form your string quartet? And there was, uh, in 90s, there was uh, three or four main really big stars string quartets, like Amadeus, recordings, I mean recording, Amadeus Quartet, Alban Berg Quartet, Guarneri Quartet, and um, Emerson Quartet. And I don't remember probably more, of course, but they were the most important for us. So we listened a lot for the, for the recordings. And then, of course, we studied with probably all of them, members of the Amadeus Quartet and members of the Alban Berg Quartet and Guarneri Quartet that were a lot in, chamber mu in the Jerusalem Music Center. They were teaching, and of course, Isaac Stern. We had good teachers, actually. <laughs> you know, nobody could say no to Isaac Stern. So he brought all the really great musicians to Jerusalem Music Center, and it was 900 meters away from the school. And we had the luxury, we, 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 could, we didn't have to, you know, to travel. They just come <laughs> to us. Yeah. I wanted to ask about the uh, Erwin Schulhoff uh, piece, that, uh, which one you're recording, and is there other music that uh, you have an interest in doing from that composer? Well, we recorded the five pieces that he wrote for String Quartet, which is like a little collection of different, uh, different music around the world. It has a tango, and it has a serenada, and it has... A, a la Cheha dance, so it's kind of you know going traveling. Actually, what we are doing most of the time, and uh, it's really kind of joy to play this music. Of course, it's not uh, maybe so uh, philosophical music as his other quartets and uh, other music, but it's somehow for this collection of songs and together with Korngold, it kind of make a, a good combination. We felt so that was the idea. Any interest in doing his, uh, his other work? Oh, yes. Yes, with the time. You know, the, the, the repertoire of string quartet is so big and so great that definitely one life is not enough to play probably 50% of it. Two lives probably also not enough, but we are trying. We, from the very beginning, I think, of our quartet, we try to make a balance with the repertoire, so we try to cover from the very early Haydn quartets to the music of, to the modern music of our days, and uh, somehow slowly, slowly build the collection. Anyone else? <coughs> no? You're very quiet, okay. Great. Well, then we will probably wrap up just now, I think, because I want to give them a chance to be on the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's very a pleasure. Much. Thank you. Sergey. Okay.